Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Cinematic Excrement. We've got an odd one on our hands today. Granted, that is often the case on this show, but this one is especially odd. A movie based on a board game. Yeah, I wish. I'd even take that. Is that even still a thing? That's the one, Battleship. Several years ago, the Hasbro Toy Company was doing quite well for itself at the box office with the huge success of Michael Bay's Transformers trilogy, which pulled in a ridiculous sum of cash, and G.I. Joe The Rise of Cobra, which wasn't nearly as successful but still pulled in a modest profit. The quality of these films may have left something to be desired, nevertheless they made money. But Hasbro's next cinematic move had many people scratching their heads. A movie based on a board game? Transformers and G.I. Joe both had plenty of characters and backstory to draw upon. Battleship, however, has none of those. It's a game about boats shooting at other boats. That's it. There's not a lot of material to work with there. However, a truly talented writer can get a great story out of pretty much anything. And with that in mind, Hasbro and Universal Pictures gave writing duties to brothers John and Eric Heber, who had previously worked on the screenplay for... Whiteout. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, this was definitely not a good sign. For Whiteout, the Heber brothers actually had a decent story from the graphic novel to draw upon. And they done fucked it up! So how poorly do you suppose they would do with no story? The answer is this poorly. 65 million dollars. Ouch. To be fair, the movie did fare much better overseas, but with the combined production and marketing budgets totaling over $300 million, it was still considered a flop. So why did it fail? Well, there are several theories. Some would blame the fact that it had to compete with the Avengers, and even though that movie was in its third week in theaters, it was quite the box office powerhouse. Some would also say audiences were turned off by the board game connection, and that's certainly plausible as well. However, I am going to invoke Oakham's Razor and choose the simplest explanation. Battleship flopped because it sucked. Honestly, I think that's it. It's a terrible movie, people recognized it was a terrible movie, and they stayed away in droves. And sure enough, it picked up several Razzie nominations. Two for Worst Supporting Actress, Brooklyn Decker, who may not have necessarily deserved it, and the eventual winner, Rihanna, who definitely deserved it. It was also nominated for Worst Picture, but it had some incredibly stiff competition in this category. In fact, I would proclaim it to be the least worst movie out of all the nominees. But it was still nominated for a reason. Probably several, actually. So let's take a look at where it all went wrong. Our hero, if you can call him that, is Alex Hopper, played by Taylor Kitsch, just one month removed from bombing horribly in Disney's John Carter. You might also remember him from X-Men Origins Wolverine, as well as a small part in Snakes on a Plane. Not a very good track record, to say the least. And the sad thing is, he is actually a decent actor. But good lord does he need a better agent. Anyway, Alex is celebrating his birthday with his brother Stone, played by Alexander Skarsgård, a commander in the United States Navy. Their celebration is going well, until a girl walks in. This is Sam, played by Brooklyn Decker who would very much like a chicken burrito, but unfortunately the bar's kitchen is closed for the night. Alex, being the horny I mean nice guy that he is, offers to get the fair lady her chicken burrito. And how does he plan to do this? By breaking into a convenience store. Because that's clearly the most sensible option. And so he enters the building through the roof while the Pink Panther theme plays in the background. Personally, I would have gone with Mission Impossible, but I guess that works too. Hey, wait a minute, play that again. Notice how he suddenly swings to the left after he lands? Could they make it any more obvious that he's on a wire? Setting aside the marketing budget, they spent $200 million making this movie. We are not off to a good start if this is what $200 million buys us. The doofus causes significant damage to the store, which earns him a tasin, bro, but he succeeds in delivering the chicken burrito to his new girlfriend. And yes, she totally falls for him after this. Because nothing turns a woman on like microwavable Mexican food and the smell of burning flesh. The next morning, Stone informs his sorry excuse for a brother that his days of being a waste of space are over and he's going to enlist in the Navy. 
I'm not sure how you can force someone to enlist, but somehow he pulls it off. And when we fast forward six years later, Alex is still a perpetual fuck up with disciplinary issues, but has somehow managed to become a lieutenant. And I find that to be just a bit suspect. A fool like him surviving in the military for six years is questionable enough, but becoming an officer? And let's not forget, he's not just an idiot, he's an idiot with a criminal record. Now, to be fair, I am not part of any branch of the US military, so my knowledge in these areas is a bit limited. However, my father just so happens to be a retired naval officer, so I decided to get his professional opinion on the matter. Let's take a look at what he had to say, shall we? First of all, the Navy requires a college degree to be an officer. And I don't mean some online program where hoodlums and safecrackers are welcome. I don't believe the movie ever specifies whether Alex is a college graduate or not, but just for fun, let's assume he does have a degree from a reputable institution that does not allow hoodlums and safecrackers. So, not Arizona State. He goes on to say, The typical progression for an officer is day zero, commission as an ensign, two years later, promotion to lieutenant junior grade, two years after that, promotion to lieutenant. And I would think it would take at least four years of exemplary service and performance as an enlisted man before any CO would even recommend him for consideration as officer material. So, four years enlisted, three months officer candidate school, four years to progress to lieutenant, that's a minimum of eight and a quarter years before someone could become, in my father's own words, such an amazing specimen of humanity. But all of this is really a moot point because, as I suspected, if you have a criminal record, the Navy will have nothing to do with you. The same goes for any other branch of the military as well, except maybe the Army. They're a bit less picky and they do have quotas to fill. So there you have it. There is no way Alex should even be in the Navy, let alone a freaking lieutenant. But I guess if he wasn't, we wouldn't have a movie. I would be okay with this. Well, whether it's possible or not, six years later he's in LT and is planning to marry Sam. But this might prove difficult as Sam's father is a freaking admiral. And he already has an issue with Alex professionally as even after six years in the Navy, he's still a useless sack of shit and on the verge of being discharged. Again, how did this fuckwit become a lieutenant in the first place? I know his brother's a commander, but surely he would have run out of strings to pull a long time ago. To make matters worse for Alex, the Admiral is played by Liam Neeson. And as we all know, you don't fuck with Liam Neeson's family. What my daughter sees in you is a great mystery to me. That chicken burrito must have been really good. Speaking of his daughter, she's currently working as a physical therapist for injured servicemen. And her newest patient is double amputee Lieutenant Colonel Mick Canales, played by Gregory D. Gadsden. And I want to draw special attention to this guy. Gadsden is not an actor. He had never acted in a feature film prior to Battleship. He is a real-life retired colonel who lost both legs to an IED in Iraq in 2007, and rather than accept a medical discharge, he chose to stay on active duty. He spent two years as the head of the Army Wounded Warrior Program, and was later selected to command Fort Belvoir, the first time a wounded warrior has commanded an Army installation. He is a legitimate badass, a true inspiration, and if I list all of his accolades, we'll be here all day. Director Peter Berg read an article about Gatson and decided to cast him in the movie purely based on his story. And Gatson was quite happy to take the part. And his performance in the movie is... actually pretty good. Especially for someone with no acting experience. I'm half a man, and half a man ain't enough to be a soldier. That's all I've ever known. It's a pity the movie doesn't focus more on him and instead chooses to focus on Lieutenant Shit for Brains. Speaking of which, what's he up to? Oh, getting attacked by aliens. Well, isn't that just, I'm sorry, what? Yeah, aliens. Frickin' aliens that are piloting huge ships that look like Transformer knockoffs. Which is weird because Hasbro owns the Transformers. So basically, they're making a cheap knockoff of their own property. Who the hell does that? And the alien weapons look quite a bit like the pegs one would use in the Battleship board game, which is incredibly silly. On the one hand, it does at least give this movie some connection to the game it's supposedly based on, 
but on the other hand, it also shows why basing a movie on that game was a terrible idea. The aliens sink Commander Stone Hopper's ship right away, which means Skarsgård is already out of the movie. And they put up a huge shield around the area, preventing anyone else from coming to their aid, including the Admiral. That means Liam Neeson, who was prominently featured in this movie's advertising, has little more than a glorified cameo. Not only is that deceptive, but why you would cast someone like Neeson and not use him as much as possible is beyond me. When Alex returns to his ship, he discovers his superiors have all been killed and he is now in command. And though he's clearly outgunned, he orders an all-out attack. So he's basically ordering everyone to commit suicide. I'm really sorry if I sound like a broken record at this point, but how did this fool become an officer? I find it hard to believe he possesses the necessary intelligence to lace his boots. Fortunately, one of his men manages to smack some sense into him and Alex calls off the attack. And when they back off, the aliens deem them to no longer be a threat and let them go on their merry way. Even though they could easily blow them out of the water right now. Who the hell do they think they are? The Borg? But they're not out of trouble for long because one of the aliens soon boards their ship to... Scan it or something? I don't know. And for some reason, they only sent one trooper to board the ship. Why would they only send one? Sure, their armor makes them very hard to kill, but not impossible. I mean, suppose he found himself staring down the barrel of a huge fucking cannon. Like now. Mahalo, mother. I did not edit that. This movie actually contains a censored F-bomb. Here's a free lesson to all aspiring filmmakers out there. If you're making a PG-13 movie, don't put an F-bomb in your script because it's going to look incredibly weak when you have to censor it for the final cut. Almost as weak as Rihanna's acting. Yeah, I can see why she won the Razzie for this movie, because she is downright terrible. Everything she says sounds so stilted and emotionless. You ever seen anything like this? No. Weird, man. I'm not even sure what she's doing in this movie. I guess the producers thought casting her would bring some name value to the film, and she definitely does have some name value as a singer, but as an actress, well, yeah, not so much. Without her in the role, the movie still wouldn't have been great, but it might have been just a little bit better if, in Rihanna's place, they had cast an actress who could actually, you know, act. While all this shit is going on, some of the aliens have started deploying troops near a massive satellite communications facility in Hawaii. Apparently, they intend to hijack said facility and use it to call for reinforcements. Now, you might ask yourself, don't the aliens have their own communications equipment? Well, they did, but it collided with the satellite on the way in and crashed. And this was apparently the only comms unit the aliens brought with them. It never occurred to this highly advanced race that was at least intelligent enough to create space travel that they should bring a backup in case something went wrong. This is the greatest threat humanity has ever faced, and they're as dumb as we are. Oh, but it gets worse. They soon discover the armor the aliens are wearing doesn't just protect them from physical attacks, but also from the sun. Because you see, these aliens are extremely sensitive to sunlight. Really. I'm not exactly sure how this species managed to survive so long with such an obvious environmental weakness, but even if we accept this is possible, wouldn't it make more sense for such an advanced alien race to plan for this weakness and invade Earth on the night side? I mean, yeah, the sun's gonna come up eventually, but at least they'd have a few hours to get the ball rolling on their plans before they had to worry about it. There's a reason why vampires hunt at night, is all I'm saying. Speaking of night, it's suddenly that time back on the boat. Passage of time, how does it work? The stupid humans are unable to track the aliens as their radar has been knocked out, but they assume the aliens aren't able to track them either because... reasons. So they come up with an alternative method of tracking them, using tsunami buoys to track water displacement. They use the buoys to plot out a grid and start firing at where it looks like the aliens are. I'll be damned. Something that actually resembles the board game, apart from those silly-ass peg bombs we saw earlier. And you know, this part of the movie is actually not half bad. 
I'm serious. It's action-packed. It's suspenseful. The science is at least plausible enough for Hollywood. I like it. If only the rest of the movie was this good. And it's stuff like this that really disappoints me, because it shows that the movie at least had the potential to be decent, if not profitable. It's one thing for a movie to have no potential, like Birdemic, but wasted potential is something else entirely. Getting back to the story, the water displacement plan has some success, but suddenly it becomes daytime again. What? And the aliens launch two of their Transformer knockoff wheels of death and sink the destroyer. Sinking the destroyer with two shots. I see what you did there. Most of the crew make it out alive, or at least the cast members who commanded the highest salaries, but there's not much that they can do now that they have no ship left. But Alex points out they do have the USS Missouri. The movie is called Battleship after all. Everyone else points out that this is outdated equipment and they have no idea how to use it, but they just happen to be surrounded by a bunch of old veterans who do remember how to use it. And it appears they've been standing around watching this conversation for the last few minutes. That's weird. Is this what old Navy veterans normally do? Stand around on antiquated machinery and eavesdrop on other people's conversations? Gentlemen, I assure you no one appreciates your service to your country more than I do. But for God's sake, get a hobby. Anyway, with the help of the old guys, they get the Missouri up and running, load the cannons, and head out to sea. I have no idea how, considering the Missouri has been a museum since 1998 and almost certainly would have empty boilers and no live ammunition on board. Hell, the filmmakers weren't even able to get it running in order to film scenes with the Missouri in the ocean. They had to use tugboats. Ain't no way this ragtag crew could make this thing seaworthy in a matter of minutes. Oh, and remember that censored F-bomb from earlier? It's not the only one. Let's drop some lead on those motherfuckers! Twice! Twice! Fuck your censored F-bombs! Well, through an admittedly decent action sequence, they managed to blow up the alien's shield generator. Meanwhile, back on the island, the aliens have the transmitter working and are ready to call home. But Mick and Sam just happen to be taking a hike nearby, and they show up to spoil the party. And Mick even gets to kick some alien ass. Clearly, that IED did not take out his balls. And with the shield down, the Admiral can finally send in the cavalry and blow what's left of the aliens to Kingdom Come. And now that the war is over, Lieutenant Alex Hopper is finally free to focus on the biggest challenge of his life. One that could possibly have a profound impact on his entire naval career. Asking the Admiral for his daughter's hand in marriage. And I am asking your permission to marry your daughter. No. <laughs> okay, that was awesome. Oh, but he's just kidding. They're actually cool now. Well, that's not so awesome. That's disappointing, really. Oh, but we're not done. There is still more stupidity after the story ends. This movie has a 10 minute end credit sequence. 10 minutes. How the hell could you possibly need that long to get through the credits for this piece of shit? It's not like they needed to pad the running time. It was already two hours. What's the deal? And if that wasn't bad enough, there's actually a post credit sequence that teases a sequel. This doesn't even qualify as wishful thinking. This is just plain delusional. And mercifully, that's it for Battleship. I wasn't expecting much going into this movie. I don't think anyone was really. But believe it or not, it's not all bad. The movie had some decent action, everything Colonel Gatson did was awesome, Steve Jablonski's score sounded pretty cool, and they worked in some good songs from the likes of Stone Temple Pilots, ACDC, and Creedence Clearwater Revival. On the other hand, the acting was hit and miss, the special effects at times looked mediocre, especially for a $200 million movie, the dialogue was atrocious, the board game tie-in was a terrible idea, and overall the story was just boring. In the end, the movie is a complete misfire and it failed for good reason, and I really can't recommend it to anyone. And I really feel bad for Taylor Kitsch because like I said, he's actually not a bad actor. But with two failed movies in as many months in 2012, his career tanked before it even had the chance to get off the ground. And it's not his fault Battleship sucked. No actor could save this script. Hopefully he can get back on track in the future because he deserves better than this. Join me next time on Cinematic Excrement when we will... Um, uh, 
Huh. Sorry, I know I had something planned for next time, but suddenly I can't recall. Oh well, until then, I'm the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it.